On this episode of Real Christianity, we are talking about the cultural obsession of pet idolatry. It's something that is plaguing America, and it's important. All that coming up right now. Welcome to Real Christianity. My name is Dale Partridge. We are going to have a great conversation about pets today. But before we begin, I just wanted to let you know that this is a audio and video ministry of relearn.org. We are on a mission to bring the church back to the Bible to increase biblical and theological literacy. We want gospel fluency in men and women and children. One of those resources that we've actually released to help not with necessarily gospel fluency, even though we do talk about the gospel, is my book. It's a children's book. It's called Jesus and My Gender. And it's really a book on affirming God's design for children or affirming your God-given gender. We don't talk about all the you know alphabet soup stuff that's going on in gender and sexual identities today, but we do talk about just the affirmation that it's good that God made boys and it's good that God made girls and we're different and we have unique beings and we have unique roles. And so it's a great book. It's a rhyme book. You can check out some of the reviews. I think we have over 400 reviews on Amazon. And we'd love for you to pick up a copy. You can pick it up from our store at relearn.org forward slash gender. You can also pick up a copy on Amazon or um, I think there's some other places that actually sell it as well. So Anyways, we would love your support that way. All of the money goes back to the ministry 100%. Again, the name of the book is Jesus and My Gender. All right, we're going to dive into this conversation, the cultural obsession of pet idolatry. Okay, to be clear, just to start it off, I want you to know that I love dogs. Uh, We're actually planning to get ourselves a uh, a Rhodesian Ridgeback when we move, we're in the middle of uh, trying to build a house and we're going to have some acreage and we want to have a Rhodesia Ridge back there to help protect our children from mountain lions and some of the other coyotes and different things that are ranging around the area that we live. Now, I want to say this because uh, I'm not saying that Christians shouldn't have pets. This is not the focus of the discussion. I want you to take this within context of what I'm really talking about, as you will see here in a second. So this week, I released a tweet that said, quote, the absurd number of dog parks being built across America is telling. We have rejected children to such a degree that many cities are building more recreation sites for pets than playgrounds for kids. Namely, our culture is so selfish that it's now shaping civics All previous generations would see spending $225,000 of taxpayer money on pet pleasure as foolish and idiotic. But cities always follow culture, and culture always follows what they worship. When Christ isn't seen as Lord, pet praise and childlessness are two sad consequences, end quote. So this was kind of a bit of a social media storm. And actually, I believe the comments proved my point as you will see many people on Instagram, I think there was over 500 comments there, uh, defending this cultural desire and obsession and fixation uh, on pet idolatry. You can see it clearly in the comments. Uh, I posted it also on Twitter, which there's a little bit of a storm there as well. I found a quote by G.K. Chesterton that I thought was quite uh, fitting for our discussion today. Uh, He says, quote, wherever there is animal worship, there is human sacrifice, end quote. Now, this is certainly true of our culture, uh, which is blood uh, bloodthirsty when it comes to abortion uh, and compassionate when it comes to adopting or caring for a pet. We all know that uh, in America, it'll cost you about $5,000 and up to one year in jail if you damage or destruct an eagle egg. I think it's even if you touch an eagle egg. While anyone, say, in a state like California can kill their baby all the way up to full term. Now, I'm fully aware of the kind of vast responsibility, uh, you know, between the differences, I should say, between like the cost of a pet and the cost of a child. But I just want to say something to illustrate a point. Um, In America, animal adoptions are about 22 to 1 over human adoptions. 
Uh, 3.5 million pet adoptions are happening per year and about 135,000 human adoptions per year. And I know you're thinking, of course, adopting a child is like $35,000 and kids are way more expensive and all, all the things that are coming up. Um, the reality is, is that in our culture, uh, you know, people spend that much money on their pets as you're going to see here just in a second. I actually was looking up online. I was trying to find some stats uh, on the cost of raising a child. There's, there's varying, like wildly radically different numbers on the internet, but I was trying to find even just stats on babies uh, what it would cost for a baby. And people were trying to say that it was like $1,500 or $2,000 a month. And I'm like, I've had three babies and I'm about to have another one. And there's no way that we're paying $1,500 to $2,000 a month for this baby. When you're, they were all these liberal sites that were factoring in like um, uh, formula and all these other things that you just don't need and, and not take any consideration that your hand-me-down clothing or gifts from a baby shower or any of these things. And so they wanted to make having a child seem like financially burdensome. That was really the overarching theme of all these websites. And so, uh, yes, children, you know, have a price. Uh, but today, the amount of money that people spend on pets, it's not much different. And so, um, but my, my point is what I'm saying is that we have a culture essentially that has literally designed itself to offer things like human abortions and pet adoption uh, for basically free, right? So you can, you can kill a baby and adopt a pet for basically free. Uh, while hospital birth of a child uh, and human adoption is like tens of thousands of dollars. So uh, what we have is a society that rewards people with convenience and the removal of financial barriers when it comes to killing children and acquiring a pet for, uh, you know, its citizens. And it burdens those same civilians uh, when it comes to adopting uh, or caring for children. And so we have something that's going on even systematically in our culture. Essentially, what, I, what I'm what trying to say here is that in America, um, we are disin uh, uh, disincentivizing a culture of children and promoting a culture of pets. That's really at the core of our, you know, societal ethos right now, or our legal system, or our financial system, or our, our social system at the very least. And so we have things that are changing all around us in regards to pets. We have pets on planes and in grocery stores now. We have pets in strollers and we have pets in car seats now. We have pets with insurance policies and annual dental work uh, we have doggy daycares. We have dog sitters. We have vegan dogs. We have pets named after their grandparents. That was a real thing I saw online. We have dogs that take Xanax and organic supplements. We have pets that have birthday parties. We have uh, people calling themselves dog moms and dog dads and referring to themselves or their, their pets as fur babies. Uh, on top of that, we actually have a market I think the global market share that I saw online for pet clothing was $5 billion for pet clothing. And so to not see the culture's movement to view pets as the replacement for children is just utter blindness. I mean, this is certainly happening right before our eyes. Doug Wilson said in a video on this topic, he says, quote, people are projecting onto their pets sentiments and affections that ought to be rendered toward a child, end quote. Uh, this is certainly what we're seeing. We have a culture that has elevated animals to a place of intrinsic value uh, or esteem that is reserved strictly for humans. And it's not that we should reject the care for pets. We like pets. You know, it's the, the, the problem is not the animal here. Uh, but to, what we're having is that uh, people are prioritizing them over children, children and then um, raising them to this societal status where they have equal care, protection, and dignity uh, before the law or before uh, at least the cultural theme of the day. And what this does is it, it actually makes, when you elevate animals to be essentially the same as humans, you essentially say that humans are animals. And that's really what's behind this way of thinking for this community that's pushing this movement. Bible-believing Christians are not the ones that are aggressively driving the movement of pet idolatry in our culture. 
It's really the liberals and the atheists that are doing that. Uh, the truth is pets and humans are not the same. Uh, they're not the same. Uh, humans are made in the image of God. Pets are not. Uh, humans have eternal, uh, eternal souls. Animals do not. Uh, humans will experience the resurrection of their bodies. Uh, animals will not. Um, now, I know there's a big discussion on, will there be animals in heaven? I believe there will be animals in heaven. I don't believe every animal that ever lived on earth will be resurrected and be in heaven um, because we have the restored heavens and the earth. This earth will actually be restored. I believe that God will actually have animals in the new heavens and new earth, but I don't think it's going to be the animals that we had on this earth. And so this is important to just see as an overarching theme because um, our death cult culture is rapidly decreasing the value of human life. Uh, and one way that they're doing that is by elevating the life of animals to the be essentially equal to the life of humans. In a study mentioned by Dennis Prager, uh, 40 to 50% of people said that they would save their dog over a stranger in a life-threatening situation. Uh, again, th this just simply illustrates the misprioritized station our culture is nurturing around pets. And it shows, again, us rendering those sentiments and affections that Doug was talking about uh, toward animals in an improper way. According to the World Animal Foundation, the pet care market is worth $207 billion around the globe, but the U.S. citizens radically actually, this is a fun fact, outspend the rest of the world on pets. $123 billion per year we spend on pets. The U.K. pet owners um, I believe this stat is right, only are spending about $7.5 billion. That was double, however, since 2005 in the UK. China uh, spent $31.89 billion. Europeans spent around $21.2 billion. And Australians spent $30.7 billion. But again, we have $123 billion per year that America is spending on the pet industry. I also heard a quote that there are now more pets in Portland, Oregon, and Seattle, and San Francisco than there are children. That obviously makes sense. Uh, that shouldn't probably shock anyone because nobody's getting married anymore. And nobody's having kids anymore because we are living in a society that is incredibly selfish. And so it makes me think of a quote by Leonard Ravenhill, who said this uh, probably 70 years ago. He was born in 1907. So, you know, in the middle of his ministry, I'm thinking is maybe in the 1950s, but he says, quote, today, Christians spend more money on dog food than missions, end quote. Uh, honestly, I, I would not be shocked to learn that the average Christian spends more money on their pet than they do giving to their church or uh, giving to the poor or supporting missions or other parachurch ministries around the world. Pets have truly become an idol in this generation, and it has certainly influenced Christians in the church because we're not questioning why we're doing some of these things in the culture. Previous generations would look at this as radically strange, odd behavior. Uh, people are literally satisfying their need for love, uh, this desire for love with their pets. They become essentially the replacement figures of spouses or children, or in some cases, God. They literally wake up you know, the priority of their day is to care for their dog and to receive love from their dog and to give love to their dog. And, and again, they're, re, um, they're, they're reprioritizing where that love should be focused upon something that is not the object of right affection. And so um, there's, this is a multifaceted problem. So I know that you're thinking about all the reasons why these things happen. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. But 1 John 2, 15 reminds us, it says, quote, do not love the world or the things in the world, end quote. Now, I'm going to make a case that things in the world could include uh, creatures that were made that are not humans. I'm thinking that things in the world could include a cat or a dog, uh, it is a creature, and we shouldn't be worshiping or idolizing the creature ever. All of our affection and worship and focus should be going towards God primarily. Animals are not a primary place to receive or to offer love. They're not a primary place. 
Okay, D- just hear me out here. They're not a primary place to offer or receive love. Now, the primary place is God and the secondary place is from people. And those people have a, an order themselves. I mean, a husband should love his wife in a primary way and love his children uh, in a primary, even secondary way and should love the people of his church, the people of God in a, in a way. And then there's love people in, in the world. I mean, so there's, there is some degrees. I mean, we definitely have a discriminating love. I mean, uh, I'm not supposed to love other women the way that I'm called to love my wife. I have a discriminatory dimension of that love. There's a hierarchical structure of love. The fact that I love my wife uh, in a way that I don't love other women doesn't mean that I don't love women. It means that I don't love other women the way that I love my wife. And the same thing is true is that Christ loves the church in a unique way, uh, in a special way. And so we have to realize that there's really not any passage of scripture calling us to love animals. It doesn't exist. Um, now, what I will say is that we're called to care for animals uh, as, uh, you know, they're, they're glorious creatures that God has given to us. We are called to enjoy them, use them, fulfilling, uh, fulfilling God's mission upon our lives. That, you know, we might have animals that help us uh, provide for our families and feed our families, uh, might work for our families and have tools, be tools for our families. But we're never to place our love in a primary way into a pet or an animal. That is a misprioritization of love. And I think that is something, sure, if you're listening to this podcast, that probably isn't you. But what I want you to realize is that we live in a world where that certainly is true of of many people. Um, I want to talk just about this boom of dog parks for a second, because um, I think it really is again telling. The boom started in 1979 and guess where? San Francisco, right? Of all places, um, the dog park became essentially uh, part of the, the liberal agenda of that time and has pushed forward. It becomes essentially the easiest and most visible representation of this cultural shift from children to pets. I think it's I, I, again, it's it's not about the dog. It's it's not even about the dog park. Beneath the dog park is starting to tell us the cultural shift that's causing the thousands of dog parks to be uh, created across the country. And so it's essentially a public indicator of an already existing societal delusion or shift or craze, whatever you want to call it. And so uh, the trust for public lands shows that there was a 40% increase in the development of public dog parks from 2009 to 2020. I expect that is continuing to grow. Uh, In other words, you know, the idea of the dog park is going viral in a civics sense. And it's, why? Why why is it? Just ask yourself the question, why are we having so many dog parks? Well, because it's, again, it's meeting the already existing desires of the people of our particular culture. Uh, we have this obsession with animals and pets because of a variety of reasons. Um, and we are now essentially creating what we want. Uh, in America, we have nurtured such a gross degree of individualism and self uh, autonomy and independence that young people don't even know how to get married anymore. They don't know how to date anymore. Uh, they don't know how to court. They don't know how to start a relationship. Young men don't know how to talk to women. Women don't know how to be in relationship with men. Birth control is on the rise for those people that do get married. Many couples are pushing back children to their late 30s. And this basically what this does is it pushes back grandparenting back a decade or so. And now millions of empty nesters have no progeny to nurture. They have no grandkids to take care of, to, to spoil with time and investment and energy. And what they do is they've quenched their desire for grandparenting with the puppy. That's what's happening all over the place. And why does this whole conversation matter for Christians? Is Dale just ranting about another thing and he's mad about some other problem that's going on? Well, it's again, it, we're talking about the deeper issue, the deeper cultural shift from uh, a culture that loves children and cares for pets to a culture that idolizes pets and hates children. And so Christians really are the ones that need to define culture, not conform to it. And it's clear that we live in a culture that worships, or again, idolizes at least, pets 
and is hostile toward children and families. I mean, it is so hard. We're in the middle of renting a house. We have friends that are in the middle of renting a house. You know how hard it is to rent a house with three, four, five kids? I mean, there's literally laws that prevent you from having a certain amount of kids in a bedroom and they want you to have, I mean, everything is against big families in this culture. I actually just saw uh, Matt Walsh's wife talk about how many crazy looks she gets while she walks around with six kids in the grocery store. And she said something about, we need to normalize big families again. And I think that's absolutely correct. Now it's clear that, um, uh, you know, we're not quite, to the point where we're bowing down to pets. You know, we're not necessarily worshiping them in the worshiping them in the physical sense. Uh, we're not praying to them, but we're honestly, we're not far from it. I've actually heard some pretty twisted new age stuff that has to do with dogs. What I mean about this conversation about worshiping or idolizing pets is what Jesus said in Matthew 6, 21. He says, quote, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also, end quote. Uh, in partnership with MetLife, there was a survey of 2,000 dog and cat owners that found that 52% of respondents said they spend more money on their pets than they do on themselves each year. And that's that's just a, honestly, it's not a shocking statistic because we live in a sad time where uh, people, again, are, that that might be a normal thing if you change that out with children. And you go, well, yeah, you should be spending that money on your children and, and blessing them and, and giving them a great education and providing them the resources and tools that they might need to flourish and thrive and give God glory. But no, we're talking about uh, spending more money upon your animal uh, than you do on yourself. Uh, about 40% of those respondents said that having a pet is just as expensive as raising a child. Uh, about six in 10 said, Having a pet is more expensive than they initially thought. An equal percentage said that they specifically allocate about $200 from each paycheck. So $400 a month just for pet necessities. Okay. So again, uh, this is this is an exorbitant amount of money that we're talking about that is a mainline trend here in our culture. So ultimately, what do we need to do? What's the point of this conversation? Christians need to catechize the culture to clarify that pets are not a substitute for children. Uh, this is something, this is a, a trend that should not be adopted by Christians. Uh, God commands Christians to marry. Uh, he commands us to be fruitful and multiply. Yeah, if you are, uh, if you are uh, single, uh, the command to you is to marry. Uh, if you're thinking about 1 Corinthians chapter seven, uh, Paul is saying, hey, if you are gifted with the gift of celibacy, um, then you can remain celibate for the purpose of full-time ministry to the Lord Jesus Christ. But the gift is celibacy. The gift is not singleness. Singleness is not a gift. Celibacy is. Uh, and so uh, we know that God desires. It's not good for man to be alone. And uh, when Adam was alone, he didn't create, uh, you know, he didn't say to, to Adam, hey, you know what, Adam, I'm enough for you. Uh, or, hey, the animals are enough for you. No, he gave him a wife. He gave him a wife. And so God wants us to be married if we're Christians. And he also wants us to be fruitful and multiply. So he wants those marriages to be fruitful in the sense that they are physically fruitful, uh, but I would say also spiritually fruitful, that we are awfully actually giving God glory. So he wants the image uh, of God to fill the entire world. Now, this is, um, again, the central purpose of marriage is, um, I would say, fundamentally children. Um, it's obviously to give God glory and to represent the gospel and all those things there. Uh, definitely sex. The fundamental purpose of sex is children. And um, and what I want you to realize is that having a pet does not make you a parent. That's really something that we need to reverse in this culture's thinking. But again, practically speaking, we, we as the church and those of you who are fathers or mothers that are listening to this episode need to demonstrate the glory and enjoyment of marriage and children to those that are around you. Um, you, you also need to be sure that you have not elevated a pet in your house uh, to such a place that your child views them as an equal family member or like a brother. I've actually heard people say like, oh, you know, 
we have seven members of our family and it's, you know, we have, they have two dogs or whatever it is. I would guard against that kind of language because it really tells a narrative that's untrue and incongruent with the scriptures. Um, so the solution to pet obsession, in my opinion, really is child glorification. Now, I'm not talking about improper glorification, uh, but to give them the glory that they deserve according to the value that God gave children and the purpose that God gave children. And this will take probably a generation or two of faithful parents that raise children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord um, to have these uh, God-honoring, gloriously obedient, uh, you know, parent-honoring children that people see and they go, oh, what a wonderful thing. Look at these wonderful children. Right now, we have such a generation of people that don't know how to raise kids because they don't know how to discipline children. They don't know how to love children. And instead, they abuse them and pervert them and distort them and and they don't guide them or shepherd them. And they create essentially hellions that society ends up hating because they're disruptive or annoying or whatever it may be. And so we need to, again, work to really show the world that kids are a wonderful thing. Uh, we need to uphold the truth of scripture that it's a blessing to have a child. And we do this through a variety of means. Obviously, the reversal of Roe v. Wade was a huge uh, push by the church to make that move in our culture today. But when this is done and the beauty of children is seen, I believe that really is the long-term approach to this problem of pet idolatry. Uh, I think that, you know, just my own situation, I, we had a, a pet when we first got married and we would say stupid things like, you know, oh, we're practicing for parenting. It's such a dumb idea. And once we had a child, you know, our pet became, you know, in a, uh, lowered in its station properly. And then a second child, it lowered again. And a third child, it lowered again. And a fourth child, right? Like we are, we are recognizing even us 10 years ago, we're falling prey to some of these uh, unbiblical concepts of pet idolatry. And so just watch yourself, uh, watch the culture around you, uh, take witness to what's happening. Um, and, you know, really work on raising godly children that the world can look at and go, amen, we love those kids. Let's get some more of them. So hopefully this episode was helpful. A little rant uh, on this discussion of pets. If you're a regular listener to this podcast, A Real Christianity, we'd love it if you would leave a review. I think we have 6,000 reviews or something on uh, Apple, and you might think, oh, you don't need another review. No, the reviews really do help the exposure of the show. It's a great way to support our ministry. Um, and we'd love to have you uh, leave a review. You don't need to even write anything. You can just tap the stars. But if you do write something, I will read it. Uh, I try to read those uh, reviews as often as possible. And they're very helpful and encouraging to us over here at ReLearn. So on that note, thank you for tuning in to this episode of Real Christianity. My name is Dale Partridge. I'll see you next time. 